Matt, thank you so much for joining me and living local with me this afternoon. I cannot wait to share your message of meditation with everyone. Thank you for having me, Jana. Absolutely. Can we walk through kind of the big steps in meditation? A lot of people hear meditation and they think, okay, this is a way to just turn the light switch off in my brain to quiet all the noise. And what you and I were actually discussing as is that it's more of a way to process some of those subconscious thoughts and be a little more gentle on what we're going through and how we're processing it. Yeah. And just to start off, I think one of the the biggest myths in meditation is the idea of turning the mind off or clearing it of thought. And so that usually sets someone up even before they, they try it for failure. And then it becomes a success or failure type uh, practice. And meditation, the definition is a state of deep, profound healing rest. So, you know, oftentimes you'll get people that will slap a label on their activity, like running is my meditation or CrossFit or HIIT training is my meditation. And what I always like to say is that's almost like calling um, carbs your protein. So let's call <laughs> meditation your meditation, right? And through the practice of what I teach, it's, it's called Vedic meditation. And so in Vedic meditation, with it, when you start the, the technique in the beginning of it, it's 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, there's a technique that helps quiet the mind, right? So the busy surface, every human mind has between 50 and 70,000 thoughts every day. And wow. studies show yeah. that 90% of those are recurring thoughts. So we're ruminating on the same thoughts over and over again. And when you have a technique to bring you from that gross, busy surface down to the more subtle, you'll start to allow the mind to quiet itself. And what's really interesting is when the mind starts to quiet, there's a unique effect that happens with the body. It's psychosomatic, right? As is the mind, so is the body, right? First dates, job interviews, cracking your knuckles as you're driving or... Right before you go in for the interview by biting your fingernails or, you know, some women, you know, twirl their hair, men tap their foot. Um, Busy mind, busy body. Anxious mind, anxious body. So the body is a direct printout of the mind. So you quiet the mind and the body will follow suit. It starts to quiet down and de-excite. And the great thing about de-exciting the body is that now you're finally able to obtain maximum amounts of rest. So studies show that in meditation, you get five times more rest than you do in your deepest states of sleep. So essentially, it's the Rolls Royce of rest. And the beauty in that is that rest is the antidote to stress, right? The body is is accumulating all of these stresses that we have throughout the day, from work, from family, from friends, and or the collective of what's going on right now in the pandemic. And when we don't have a tool or an outlet to release those, they stay in. And what's really what's really neat is Harvard Medical School just came out with a recent study showing that stress is responsible for 90% of all doctors' visits today. So as a byproduct of keeping all of these stresses in, we're getting secondary disease like cancer, heart disease, um, strokes, you know, all of these kind of extreme ailments. And what's what's nice is you have the, the ability to release those and purify them. So in that rested state, essentially what happens is the, the nervous system's uh, finally able to create order and starts dissolving and releasing the stresses. Those stresses, uh, by definition, are an abnormality at the structural or material level. So that indicates, if it's at the material level, indicates that we store it directly in the body, right? So when it gets released, it causes activity to occur. So that activity in meditation brings the body back up to the surface. And as is the body, so is the mind. So the mind starts to come back up. And as it does, it's recognizing the release that just occurred and labeling it as a thought. So contrary to what everyone's always said about meditation, thoughts are actually good because they're evidence of stress being released from your body. What you do with those thoughts is what I teach. That's so interesting that it's really contradictory to um, what we, what we're usually thinking of as thoughts and we're trying to push them away from the forefront of our mind, especially if it's not something pertinent to what we're doing that's right in front of us. We're always trying to push it back, push it back. So what you're saying is that it's almost like a bubble. It's better to let it pop and release and move on from it. 
and actually acknowledge those thoughts and process them as opposed right. to smushing them down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the idea of smushing it down is that it doesn't go anywhere but back down again. Mm -hmm. And that's those those signaling, the, the feeling of the, the emotions that are arising are the the way of the body saying like, hey, these are no longer relevant. We're trying to release it. And the mind says, don't want to deal with that right now and pushes it back down. But when you have a really easy, simple technique to allow that to naturally dissolve, it really starts to clear the way. And it's almost the way that I would describe it is if you have a lot of windows open on your computer, you know, sometimes like the mouse will move slower and it's harder to get the pages loaded because there's so much open. And in meditation, it's almost like going through and just Xing out all the windows from like two months ago that you were searching for whatever and you're just Xing everything out and now it frees up more of that hardware usage. So everything works more effectively and efficiently and that's kind of the same way our bodies are, are wired as well. That's such a fantastic analogy because it, it's true, you know, the more the more we're requiring of our mental bandwidth, the slower we're gonna be able to process and like you said, it, it relates right back to sleep. Um, for everyone that didn't know, Matt and I were both former athletes and one of the most important parts of athletic performance was that recovery. Mm -hmm. And you recover the fastest when you're asleep, but so many of us have that challenge of actually getting to sleep. I know that that's um, my struggle is the second my head hits the pillow, even though I'm fatigued from the day, I'm excited to sleep, I'm ready to go. And then I am just pinged wide awake with a slew of things, you know, business ideas or, you know, design ideas for the house or, Hey, did I leave this on? You know, it's just all of a sudden everything that you didn't acknowledge during the day just hits you. And so for me, I think allowing that 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, we, we all have 40 minutes in the day. We do. We all have the same 24 hours in a day that Beyonce does. So we can find 40 <laughs> minutes for ourselves, um, to, to be a kinder to, to our, to our minds and to our mental state. How do you suggest that people get started with this? I know that sometimes you just set an alarm and it says, no, really get up and meditate and do this. Yeah. And, and you know, my first thought on that is it, it's almost similar to swimming, right? If someone mm -hmm. wanted to learn how to swim, um, you know, apps or YouTube videos, it would be really challenging to really kind of understand it and then get in the water and try it out. Um, it would be almost like, you know, <laughs> renting a boat here in Florida, jumping off and trying to figure out how to swim while you're in it. Um, I watched a video on it. I got it. <laughs> right. Right. I got my app right here. But, um, yeah, I, meditation. I mean, it's the same as, you know, getting in the shallow end with the swim instructor. They show you how to float body buoyancy, how to blow bubbles. Okay. Front stroke. Now we're doing backstroke flip turns. And then once you learn how to, how to swim, you could swim in any body of water, ocean, lake, river, with, without problem, self-sufficiently. And so that's what I do with meditation. I don't necessarily recommend an onboarding ramp of like, just try a couple minutes with your eyes closed and breathing in um, because, you know, it would be, you know, you either learn how to meditate or, you know, you, you don't. Same with kind of swimming, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's that same comparison. And I think it's very similar to any new skill that you're going to learn. I, I always encourage people to find a professional and something that they are, if they're going to make a big change, because the best way to set yourself up for success is to learn how to do it the right way. Just like with working out, if you have a technique, um, you know, for Olympic lifting or, you know, you start to, you know, lift weights or something like that, you want to make sure that the technique is correct mm -hmm. and that the information you have is correct, because if not, then you're building bad habits and you're actually setting yourself up for failure because it's not going to necessarily be the proper way or the proper way for you just because it works for somebody else that maybe you saw online or that you, like you said, you saw on an app, it wasn't necessarily customized to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's similar to going into a CrossFit gym and mm -hmm. not really having a, an idea of the technique or how to do things properly. You could kind of hurt your back. You could throw out your Ooh. shoulder. They bite uh, in the ACL. Yep. Right. You do a few <laughs> sessions with, you know, the, the owner or a trainer there and they show you how to kind of lock your back in and make mm -hmm. sure your shoulders lock in if you're putting something over your head. So, um, you know, just similar with the, with having a, a guideline and a methodology to a technique. And I, I think it circles back to what you were talking about in terms of actually processing those thoughts that come through. Because sometimes when we're doing that on our own, we don't necessarily know how to negate what is going to be useful and what's going to be um, you know, what's going to kind of be superfluous thinking. 
And so if you do have a guide and I know that you do different retreats, you do one-on-one sessions, I'd love to talk about the different things that you offer in your practice to help support people in learning their own practice. Yeah. So uh, what I do is I teach um, virtually, so uh, over Zoom, and I do groups of anywhere between four and six. So sometimes friends or family would like to put a group together. And um, the I also do privately. So I'll work one-on-one or just with couples, something to that nature. And to begin with in the course, I do three days and it's two hours each day. So consecutively back to back. And by the end of the three days, you know how to meditate 100% self-sufficiently on your own with no questions asked. And then I have follow-ups. So I like to be able to support through the process. Sometimes um, there's people that have kids, you know, Sarah just kept you know, running in my room and jumping on me while I was meditating. What do I do? And so I want to be able to support that. Or um, you know, I had a, a signature required on a UPS package and the doorbell rang. And now I'm in, do I stay in my meditation or do I know I need to go sign for that? Do I get the door? <laughs> right. What do I do? And so to be able all, to answer all those questions where some of these individual circumstances arise, um, I think is, is really important. And so anyone that learns from me and goes through the process, um, I always support them in their meditation career for life. So years down the line, I've been teaching full time now for four years, and I still get emails from some of my my students from years ago. You know, this bubbled up. What was it that you said that I should do during this time? And and so being able to support them during that is great. And that's so important because it, it goes hand in hand. You want people to be able to meditate independently and continue that journey on their own, but you don't want people to feel like they're no longer supported because our, our circumstances change. My schedule and my daily routine um, from you know three or four weeks ago is completely different than what it is now. And mm-hmm. so having somebody there to support you when those life changes come, you know, maybe you learn to meditate as a couple and everything's peachy keen when it's just you two and the dog and all of a sudden a baby comes. Mm-hmm. And like you said, there's a lot of crying going on. I'm up 15 times a night. Um, having somebody to support you when those life changes occur or if we experience something. And like you said, new feelings or, you know, new thoughts decide to bubble up. We have a partner to help us process those. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, my take on that is I want a lot of graduates. I don't want a lot of students. I want people to be self-sufficient, but know that I'm there rooting them on from the sideline and encouraging them to keep going. That's that's fantastic. I think that genuinely sets you apart um, because unfortunately what we see a lot of times um, with things that are kind of repetitive uh, mental medicines are that they become dependent on that person mm. and it really kind of contradicts you know the, the practice in the first place because we want to be independent. We you know want to be medication free. We want to be mental medication free um, and this practice sounds like it really allows people to, like you said, graduate to self-sufficiency while still making sure you're here in case they need support later on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's great because, you know, coupling the, the knowledge and the wisdom of it, of meditation with, with an experience and a technique, what's nice is, you know, we don't lack any of the software, right? With podcasts and YouTube videos and everything going on, all the Instagram live, there's so much information that we can get if we wanted to. And we all know how to act, right? We all know what to do, but we generally act in accordance to how stressed our nervous system is. You know, when you're driving on the road and someone cuts you off, is it, especially, you know, today, you know, yesterday I was driving and um, everyone's like kind of speed racer. It's almost like this, (laughs) this angst or everyone's kind of all pent up and you know someone cuts you off is it like where you're honking and kind of you know getting a little bit upset or even just in your own car with yourself like that's ridiculous I can't believe this happened Um, that would be more of a stress response because we're used to activating the the sympathetic our fight or flight response and you know with meditation we're starting to tap into the parasympathetic the rest digest reproductive I like to call it the stay and play uh-huh. And, you know, it, it's it's such a, a defining difference where, you know, someone cuts you off and you're coming from more of that stay and play. Um, it's like, man, they must be really stressed right now. They must be under a lot of pressure or feeling a lot of anxiety. And you start to step outside of yourself and ease off the gas, let them in and let them do what they're going right. to do. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic point because I'm probably one of those drivers that's just like, come on, like what's, you know, what's happening? I'm looking at their license plate to see where they're from. I'm just right. like, oh, you know, just, and, and you're right. In the, in the grand scheme of things, if they need to get to that red light before I do, it's, it's all right. It's right. not going to change my day for the better or for the worse. Um, you know, and I don't need to give mental power to that situation necessarily. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love for people to be able to, to get in contact with you, to find out more about what you do. And I want to make sure that, that I get signed up because this sounds like something I can actually process and process and do. Um, something that I know has always kept me from meditating is I thought it was going to be hours and hours, you know, sitting somewhere with my eyes closed, you know, trying to manifest whatever. And I'm like, I don't have hours and hours, you know, I've got a job, I'm busy. I got dogs, but I got this, I got that. But it sounds like you have a, a really clean line towards, towards success and towards that knowledge. And like you said, that support, um, after you, after you graduate, but everyone, everyone has a few hours that they can set aside and that they can learn from you. Um, and I'd love for people to find out where they can, can sign up with you and learn more and get to know you in, in your practice more. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my website is matthewcardone.com. So I update that pretty regularly and you can um, sign up for newsletters and contact me directly to set up a, an intro talk where we can hop on a quick phone call and um, I could give you a little bit more information about how the course rolls out and, and what it entails. Um, you could also follow me on Instagram, Matt Cardone Meditation. So I try and provide some content on there on, on some meditation and um, just relevant with what's going on today. And Facebook is, is Matt Cardone as well. Well, I will make sure that everybody has all the links so that they can get connected with you and they can find that mental piece that, that you enjoy. Um, and Elle enjoys as well. Um, I'm really looking forward to giving it a try myself and looking forward to living local with you again, Matt. Thank you, Janet, for having me on.